Last week we, uh, we finished up, we were talking about communion frequency a good amount, and then we talked uh, lastly about preparation for the service of the sacrament, that is preparing to receive the sacrament of the altar. Um, we went through Christian questions and their answers, which is a great resource on page 329 of the hymnal, uh, to examine yourself um, for receiving the Lord's body and blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and then we kind of breeze through these last ones that part of the, the Lord's Supper is also living at peace with one another. Matthew 5, when, when you bring your offering to the altar, make sure if you have anything against your brother, you go and settle first with him. Uh, this, of course, absolutely makes sense for the Lord's Supper as well. That as you commune at the same table, you want to make sure you're at peace with your fellow Christians. Okay? Uh, that, that, that you have, if you have any disputes with one another, you, you, you make up, you, you reconcile. Uh, how is it Christians can reconcile? Do we reconcile uh, only when we agree? No, Sometimes we reconcile by the blood of Christ, by forgiving. Um, sometimes that means actually confronting that person, talking to them, um, you know, uh, calling out maybe their sin or confessing your own sin to them. Okay. Sometimes, however, um, if, you, if you'd rather just quote-unquote not have to confront them, what is our option then? Pray. pray. To pray? Absolutely. How about forgive them from your heart? Right? Gladly do good unto them as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Right? And then there's, of course, the scripture that talks about how love covers a multitude of sins. And that, that is ultimately the, the covering, is that you realize, you know, out of love for this person, I'm not going to hold this wrong against them. And this is all part of being reconciled, living in peace with one another before you take communion. Okay? Uh, Romans 12 to 18, I put in there, uh, that's a great verse. It, it's, it's a great verse for our present day and age because it says, Insofar as it is possible with you, live at peace with all people. Okay? Which, which of course means, of course, whenever you're talking reconciliation, it's not just one person, it's two. And, and maybe the other person doesn't want to reconcile. Which is why that verse comes in great comfort when you try and the other person doesn't want anything to do with that. To realize that even God's word says, in so far, in as much as it depends upon you. You know, you are to put in the effort. You are to, to reach out. And, and if that person doesn't receive that, then that's that's on them. Okay? Um, 1 Corinthians 1 reminds us to have the same mind and judgment with those whom you commune. So this is part of that close communion, uh, same confession that we talk about. That, that you have the same mind and judgment. Uh, so it's not just necessarily uh, the same doctrinal points, but it also gets into judgment, which means kind of more of the practical even application of that. That's the sameness that we pray to God for, and that's the sameness we strive for as Christians. Okay? And then lastly, I pointed out that there is a prayer at the front cover of the hymnal. There's a number of prayers in there uh, for various situations coming into church and so forth, uh, getting ready for communion, after receiving communion, uh, all those various things as well. Uh, just right, if you flip open the hymnal, right in the front cover. So, some very helpful things to help you. Uh, Prepare yourself to receive the Lord's body and blood, uh, which is very good for you, uh, very good for all of our members to receive that offering. Yes, sir. Yes. It seems like it's kind of hard to live at peace with someone that says it's all right to kill the unborn, yeah. or that same-sex marriage is the thing that we want to do. How do you suggest that? Okay, so when you're dealing with people, the difficulty is, is when the one who says that says they're also a Christian. Okay, when they say that and they're just a pagan, then you can show them the love that we have to have towards every pagan because they're acting in ignorance, in spiritual blindness, and so forth. Now, if they claim to be Christian and do those things, that's a whole different story because now they're trying to slap the name of Christ on those things, and that is a matter of rebuke, where, where you have to say, no, but the fifth commandment would say you can't do that. That that's not, that's not God pleasing. Um, so so you can do that, 
and you can interact with those folks, and they might, I mean, they, they most likely, the way sinful natures work is you, you get approached about a sin, and your first response is what? Defensiveness, no way, and so forth, right? And that might be where they're stuck. I mean, because that's a pretty grave error to embrace those kind of things, um, because they're directly spoken of in, the command, in commandments. Uh, so how do, you, how do you live with that? Um, uh, you pray for them. Obviously, uh, they're in deep error if they think that's acceptable in the Christian faith, which it's not. Um, and then you, you, you also, in, in some sense, and this is a harder teaching, is that you can pray that, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He will repay. So anytime we're tempted to take it out on another person, whether they're Christian or pagan, um, we need to be mindful of that verse. That No, we're not given to, to exact vengeance. Um, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So the, we commend these people to God in prayer, and we pray for repentance, true faith, um, that they would mend their ways and so forth. But then ultimately we pray to God that, you know what, if, if they are hardened in this error, and, and truly uh, not a part of your church, because if you're hardened in that error, can't stay a believer in Christ for long, uh, living in that kind of sin. Um, you pray that, yeah, vengeance belongs to God. He will repay. And so that's like any personal offenses when they come after you for being pro-life or whatever, um, you know, for, for your racism, for your bigotry, whatever charge they want to put it nowadays, because every one of those words becomes a buzzword just meant to shut people down. Um, you, you need to pray and, and trust God to take action. Because we're not given to take action, um, not in relation to their to their sins in that respect. I mean, we can speak, but beyond that, yeah. Can, can you pray to smoke thy enemies? Yeah, well, the Psalms to are filled God. with that. To God. Yeah, to God, and then you trust it to God. See that? That's the godly way to deal with that, because there is such a thing as righteous anger, and it does happen that you see unrighteousness, and, and it, it, you know this is an offense to God, it's an offense to church, it's an offense to Christians. Rah! And what do you do with that? Well, I'm not given to enact it in this world, so I entrust it to God, who is Lord of now and then. And it's in his care and keeping. He says, vengeance is mine. So he'll repay those who mock him and, and do wicked things. He'll repay it. But then my trick, and this will be the trick of every Christian who prays these kind of prayers, is you have to then leave it to God. Because your flesh, when it gets a hold of righteous anger, your flesh comes up with all kinds of reasons that it can, ooh, all right, I'm justified to act out now. No. No. And these things to God's care and keeping, and we leave it to God's care and keeping. Um, so, yeah. Dan? Yeah. Well, I saw one of these, you know, one night came out, and it just is, that they did a prayer, and that they should be numbered, and that they be few. There are a number of what they call imprecatory psalms, and what those imprecation, imprecatory psalms are is they, they are kind of almost curses. That you're praying for God to solve a bad situation. And that, that he would punish the wicked. Um, because when the wicked are punished, what happens to people around? They're drawn to God. Well, their own wickedness is in some way rebuked as well. That it's a reminder that, whoa, God is serious about his law. Um, so, so when God does rebuke the wicked and, and strike them down and so forth, it's meant to be a cause for repentance on our part and also caution against our own flesh, which wants to act out in the same kind of ways. So, but yeah, uh, there's, there's all kinds of psalms. And, and again, if, if the Holy Spirit saw fit to write these down, then they certainly are godly prayers. But the trick is always to leave that prayer with God in God's hands. Because your flesh will be more than happy to try to become God's agent. And, and that's... That's the dangerous ground. So, good questions. All right. So, moving into the service of the sacrament now. All right. You got really three parts of the sacrament uh, of the service of the sacrament. You have the preface, which is kind of like your preparation. 
your introduction, so forth, okay? You have the administration, so that's kind of a strange word for it, but that's actually uh, the words of institution and then the distribution of it, okay? Administer is, is the, it comes from the Greek word which means literally to hand over, okay? So, so this is talking about uh, the pastor's task of handing over the things of Jesus to his people, in particular the sacrament here. And then you have the post-communion, which is focused upon uh, the, the fruitful reception of the Lord's Supper. That is, you know, that God has blessed you with this meal, and now may it bring forth fruit in your life. And so that will include, like, the nunc dimittis, and the, and the prayer of the post-communion collect, and so forth. Okay? Alright, just to start us out, it starts out with, again, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Um, I simply copied and pasted the slide from previous times you've gone through it. Uh, it's part of preparing for your supper. Um, this, is, this all is from before hearing the word of God. So how are hearing the word of God and sacrament similar? Because we said this before we heard the word of God and so forth. Well, it's the same. It's, it's God coming to us. Whether by his word or by his body and blood. So they're the same in that respect. This blessing of the Lord be with you is found all over in Scripture. We've gone through these passages before. It's just over and over and over. When you wish for the Lord to be with someone, you are blessing them. You are asking for God, the good and gracious God, to be with them. To be present in their life and so forth. Um, and, and so then this, this Lord's presence is used as a phrase of blessing, security, peace, victory, hope throughout the Old Testament. So this blessing goes all, all the way back. How has the Lord promised to be with us? Right, through what means and why is that significant here? Through the word and sacraments. Through the word and sacrament. And so here, at the beginning of the service and sacrament, it's significant because we're getting ready to receive the sacrament of the altar. Uh, this salutation precedes these major parts of the service. Service of the word, service of the sacrament. Okay. Um, he greets the people with the blessing of the Lord, being with the people. It's both a blessing and a prayer. Um, tradition takes this as an adaptation of Christ's peace be with you, which is, of course, his greeting to the disciples on Easter evening. That now peace with God, the Father, has been established by the blood of his Son, and now the Son just freely gives that peace out. And so is church. Freely gives that peace out. Okay. Uh, pastor speaks to the people as God's called servant, called by God, accountable to Christ, and serving for the sake of the baptized. That's why pastors are there. They serve for the, your sake. Right? That's why God puts them there. Okay, with thy spirit, which is a beautiful phrase, and it's a beautiful prayer. Okay, it's not just a as we talked about before, it's not just like a handshake. It's much more than that. It's a, it's a blessing. It's a, uh, it's a prayer that the Holy Spirit will rest upon him, especially now as he moves into the part of the service to administer the sacrament to the congregation. Right? We've, we've, we've done this before with, with him praying for the congregation, as well as leading the congregation and hearing God's word and then preaching God's word. Well, now we're also going to hear it um, as, as a pastor now, administers the sacrament to God's people. The congregation affirms, affirms the call of the pastor, his vocation with respect to, and Christian love. The Spirit is with him as he ministers this day. Uh, as we talk about that, sometimes this is called the little ordination. It's kind of a confirmation that we pray that God's Spirit would be our, with our pastor as he conducts this liturgy, as he conducts this administration of the sacrament. Okay. Prayer and hope that the Spirit will be with your pastor as he cares for souls. Uh, without the Holy Spirit, your pastors are, are worthless. They're not going to get anything done. Okay. It's just plain and simple. The Holy Spirit is the one that does all of the work. Okay. Why this cry, Chrysostom, who's fourth century Christian church father? You are reminded that he who stands at the altar does nothing. The grace of the Holy Spirit is present and coming down on all. It's the Spirit who does everything. Okay. okay, so we covered that many times. But, so now we move into the other part of the, sac the preface, the preparations for the sacrament. 
And you have this, these sentences, they call them. And, and the first one is, lift up your hearts. And the pastor, of course, lifts his arms as a gesture, and, and, and so forth. Um, somebody got your Bible handy. Go ahead and go to Lamentations 3. I'm going to stop the Zoom share because nobody's there, so... Lamentations 3. When you get there, go ahead and read it. 41 and 42. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have to transgress and rebel, and you have not forgiven and one of those really sobering texts in Lamentations. Uh, if you know anything about the book of Lamentations, written by Jeremiah, five chapters. The third chapter is the only one ha that has a little bit of hope in it. Uh, and this is the one where we get that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, is from Lamentations chapter 3. Here we're getting towards the end of chapter 3, and, and it's lifting up your hearts and hands to the God in heaven. And why? Because we have transgressed and rebelled, you have not forgiven that God is chastising his people here. That the sins of Israel, Jerusalem in particular, have, have risen to the point that God has used a foreign army to crush them. And so now they're lamenting. And they're confessing their sins. We have transgressed and rebelled and you have not forgiven. That's their current state. God is chastising them. He is giving them uh, their due rewards, although I still would argue he's still being merciful to them. They still have life. And, and that, that is a mercy in itself for those who are, are, are unfaithful, like those in Israel and Jerusalem were at the time. And so here you have this occasion where you have lift up our hearts and our hands. Um, kind of our indication of this lifting up your hearts. Now there are all kinds of other times in scripture where it talks about lifting up your heart. But almost to, a, a, to, a, to every one of them, it is an expression of sinful pride. Where God is referencing, uh, the people have lifted up their hearts to me. And they're, they're, they're getting puffed up, and so to speak. They're kind of reminiscent of the Tower of Babel. You know, let us make a name for ourselves. We'll build a, build a tower into heaven and so forth. Okay. So who's lifting their hands at this point? Pastor just did, right? Who's lifting hearts? Congregation. Congregation, the people. What is this an act of? Confession. But yet, what's beautiful? Why would we be doing this at this point in the service? What motivates us to confess our sins? What does God do to our confession of sins? What does He do to our sins? <laughs> Forgives them. So, Okay, we're getting repentant, we're, we're confessing sins and so forth. Well, what are we doing that for? Well, we know what God's going to do with those sins in just a moment. Right? This phrase, lift up your hearts, lift them up to the Lord, uh, is first used in the liturgy in the early 200s. It's the liturgy of St. James. Colossians 3.1, I put up there. That's the one where it reminds us to put our minds into heavenly things, which is also an application of... Lift up your hearts. Think on heavenly things. Because what's coming to earth right now at the time of the sacrament? What's coming to earth? Yeah, heaven itself, right? This is, this is like back to the Gloria type moment. We'll get to that in a second. Um, it ties in well with the singing of the Sanctus, holy, holy, holy. But yet, of course, the church's Sanctus isn't just the song of Isaiah in heaven, but then it becomes, uh, blessed is he, blessed is he, and so forth. It means it comes back down to earth. To Palm Sunday. Hosannas, and so forth, and we'll get to that eventually as well. We lift them up unto the Lord, so this would be not proud, <laughs> okay? But a plea for grace from God, and we know His answer, it's coming in the supper. Okay. Um, this, is, this is over and against all those who would claim that the church is, is just nothing but a bunch of holier-than-thou type stuff. Um, it's a false accusation. Because properly speaking, Christians are sinful people. 
And, and being Christian just means that you know who takes care of your sins. Not that you've put all those sins away. Because you'll have them as long as you have flesh. But we know as Christians who takes care of those sins, who takes them away, who cleanses us. And that's the difference between a Christian and a pagan. A pagan is still trying to cleanse themselves. Whereas a Christian is trying to have Christ, trusting Christ to cleanse him or her. Okay? Questions on this? Okay. It goes on. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. This is right from Psalm 136, Psalm of Thankfulness. If you ever need a thankful psalm or when you're coming up here on Thanksgiving. Right? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Imagine that, three mentions. What were they on to? Triune God. To him alone does great wonders, for a steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens for a steadfast love. You can see this, right? This is this is a this is a congregational psalm. And you can almost hear it responsively, right? You have the, the psalm leader and he's and he's chanting this or singing this, and then you have the congregation or several choirs singing this. And then you just have this over and over refrain and responsiveness amongst God's people in worship, giving thanks to God. Right? And that's, that's the thing, we're, we're, we're moving into thankfulness. Right after we confess things, we move right to thankfulness. Why? Because we know God's answer. We know what he's going to do to sins. We know he's, what he's going to do. He's going to forgive them. He's going to give us his body and blood. As he's promised, he keeps his word. Right? Beautiful here in that they, they confess all these things about creation. And then they move into um, the, the acts of God specifically, other than creation, but the acts of God specifically for them. And you could write extra stanzas of this, not in your inspiration spirit, but you could about the things that God has done in your life. Just as those people took care of their heritage, and they remembered their heritage as God's work for them out of Egypt. Brought Egypt out, brought Israel out, strong hand after strong Red Sea crossing, right? Over through Pharaoh. All these wonderful testimonies about God's works to save them. Um, struck down great kings, mighty kings. And it starts listing some of them. Yeah. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state, rescued us from our foes, gives food to all flesh. So this is, this is the psalm that this kind of comes from. This mindset of, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Um, I, I often will say this, I don't know if I've said it on Sunday morning or not. Uh, the Greek word for thanks is Eucharist. Which is why sometimes you'll hear people talk about the Lord's Supper and they call it the Eucharist. Especially if they're Episcopalians or something like that. Um, it is one of those words historically that's used for the Lord's Supper. We typically, as Lutherans, don't stress it because it oftentimes lends towards focusing not upon Christ and his gift, but upon us and our thanks. And so that's why we're kind of meh. But as a correction to that, at the very center of the word Eucharist is the word charis, which is the word for God's grace. That even our thanks is rooted in the grace of God. Uh, undeserved. We, we don't deserve these gifts from God, but He graciously gives them to us because that's who He is. He's a gracious God. Okay. Yeah. So again, speak this right away after repent, uh, after lifting up of our hearts because we know what God's doing here. What He's going to come and help us with. And what He's going to do for us through His body and blood. Which is why the congregation's immediate response to those give thanks to the Lord our God is it is meet and right so to do. And here's of course your old archaic language. What does it mean? Well, it's fitting, it's proper, it's right. Yeah, we should do this. Okay. Why would it be proper to give thanks here? What's interesting is this is starting already before we even get to the word institution. 
to tie into the Word of Institution. Because what does Jesus do when he takes the bread? He gives thanks. He gives thanks. What does he do with the cup? He gives thanks. He gives thanks. So even before he consecrates it, he's giving thanks for it. And so even before we have the supper, we're giving thanks for it. Just like our Lord. Okay. Um, pastoring people together in their respective roles. Okay. All right, let me get to this thing called the proper preface. Okay. Um, we already had the preface. That's those first sentences and so forth. Now we get to the proper preface. Um, this is the part that is, it is truly meet, right, and salient that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy God, Holy Father, our Heavenly Father. Um, yeah, everlasting God. Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Uh, this is only for Sundays, by the way, so if you're ever here on a Monday night, you usually don't hear this one. Um, Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, and we're praising you and saying, and then you guys wrote the song to us. So the one you heard today, because it was a festival of St. Luke the Evangelist, you get, it is truly meet, right, and salutary, repeating again what the congregation has said, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. So again, when should a Christian give thanks? St. <laughs> Paul says, always. Right? He tells us to pray without ceasing, he also tells us to give thanks, always. Okay? Uh, to who? The Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Everlasting God. Um, the Father loved us and sent His only begotten Son for us. Um, and then it moves on in the ev Evangelist one. It says, For you have mightily governed and protected your holy church. Okay. We're 2,000 years after St. Luke. Well, maybe a little less than 2,000. But God has still governed and protected his church. Now, can you imagine the despair in people's minds as they saw Peter and Paul arrested by the government, killed by the government? Um, and and I say, I've said this before, there, there's no government that's outlived the church, nor will there be. Okay? No matter how harsh they get, no matter how fierce they fight against God's own people, um, the church remains moves on. Okay. Or as St. Paul says, you know, the government's the one that's used by God to send him home. So, right? In which the blessed apostles and evangelists, and there's just a distinction, apostles would be like Matthew um, and, and John, Peter, and so forth, Paul, um, specific requirements in scripture for being you know, an apostle, but then evangelists, that's the title, like I said in the sermon, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel writers. Yeah, there's also the New Testament category of evangelists as well, as well, but this is talking about the gospel writers themselves. With your servant St. Luke, with all the... Oh, no, sorry. Proclaim your divine and saving gospel. Okay? Because, of course, Luke and Mark and Matthew and John proclaim through their writing of the gospel. Um, and then, of course, the apostles go out and they preach that gospel wherever they're at. So that's what we're talking about here. The, your divine and saving gospel. This is God's gospel, but it's also a gospel that saves. It has the power in itself for salvation. Therefore, with patriarchs, so that's like Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so forth. And prophets, that's like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all those minor guys. Apostles, like I said, that's Matthew, John, Peter, Thomas. Those kind of guys, evangelists, those are the four gospel writers. And with all the company of heaven, and so this is what you got in the other one, it's with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. Um, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. We should probably go back to the task here. Ha! Right? Um, it is a, it's a prayer. So what should you be doing when the pastor's chanting this up in front? It's actually a prayer. So you could fold your hands and pray. Okay? Uh, it, it isn't considered a prayer. Uh, I say that it's an ancient prayer uh, because it has Jewish roots. 
that, that as they were having a meal, the head of the household would bless the bread. He'd hold his hand over the bread, and he'd say this, Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the world, who have brought forth this bread from the earth. Okay. He's all part of this. And then he'd do the same with the wine. Okay. Um, it's a seasonal part of liturgy, as you saw today. Today we heard the, the seasonal proper preface for the day of an apostle or an evangelist. Uh, pictured here is the Revelation worship. So, it's so a Revelation, it's beautiful, it's got all kinds of beautiful imagery and so forth, and yeah, there's things in there that people can interpret in scary ways, and there are people who try to stir up fear by it. But it's an amazingly comforting book, because it's a book of, of God's care for His people, and, and taking care of them through all these different things in the world. Right? But the beautiful part, really most beautiful parts of Revelation are its pictures of heaven. Uh, and there you see Revelation 7 come to mind. We have people of all tribes and nations and peoples and so forth, and there, there's singing going on between different groups in heaven, and everything is centered around the Lamb. Everything's centered around Jesus. And, and so this is this is that part with angels and archangels with all the company of heaven. And this, this part of the liturgy becomes an incredibly caring part of the liturgy. Um, it still happens for me as I, as I sing this, as I chant it. I think about my dad. I think about my grandfather. I think about my grandmother. You know, all the company of heaven. Right? Those who've gone on before us in the faith. And, and that, that's this part of the, the comforting nature of this. That all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is praising the Lamb. And here we're seeing a little foretaste of it. We're getting a glimpse of it here on earth in the sacrament and the worship of God that happens in faithfully receiving the sacrament. And, uh, and, and the comfort of that and, and just kind of, it, it, it's tied to, to everything before us. Right? That's, that's the beauty of including those phrases. Um, the church isn't so lost in time right here and right now. The church is throughout time. You've got to remember that we're just a small portion of the church. The biggest portion of the church is actually already in heaven. Because it's all Christians who've been faithful throughout their lives, throughout all history. Abraham's up there. Isaac, Jacob, Adam, Seth, Abel, all those guys. They're all up there. So... It's a beautiful and it's comforting thing. Okay? Uh, these are always thanks to the Father for the Son, and it involves all of heaven and the church. That is, so all the creaturely things, angels and archangels and creatures and so forth, like we get from Revelation, but then also the church. And that means the church here on earth, the militant church, but also the church in heaven, the triumphant church. And of course, we'll, we'll get that distinction in a couple weeks with All Saints Day, um, where we bring out all these wonderful hymns and lessons and so forth, um, to celebrate how God is so faithful to us, sustains us in our faith all our lives through, and takes us home to heaven at the end. Okay. Now, have we ascended into heaven, or has heaven come to earth? Heaven has come to earth. By the power of God's word, Jesus is going to be there in his body and blood. Uh, this is this is like this is like the glory. This is like the heavenly hosts show up in the sky, and they, and they start praising God, and the shepherds start praising God, and they wonder what's going on, and they follow the angels' directions and everything else. That something on earth has utterly changed. Something new has happened, and here it is. Every time you have the Lord's Supper, this is the same kind of thing. That, that all of heaven is is a part of this. Um, some churches, uh, you will see it happen. Uh, Norwegian churches especially do this. Um, they'll have uh, they'll have the communion rail, and it'll go to the wall, and then they'll have some muralist or artist come in, and they'll paint the other side of the rail in heaven with with people and angels and figures and stuff. You know that that we're all there, heaven and earth united in the sacrament. It's just, it's a beautiful thing, and it's a beautiful foreshadowing of what is yet to come. So um, it's a very good thing. All right, so, that's my last slide for today. All right. Questions?
emphasis on this first. Yeah? What's the difference between an angel and an archangel? Arch is the Greek uh, prefix for chief. So an archangel would be chief angel. That there are ranks in the angels. And so the, the angel we get in scripture that is archangel is Michael. Uh, Gabriel is just referenced as an angel. But Michael is, is referenced as an archangel. Okay. Um, and it just means chief angel, which means that... I mean, they're called a host, which is literally an army. So I suppose, you know, if you want to view it that way, that God has commanders of angels and something like that. So, so an archangel is, yeah, just a chief angel. Was it Lucifer at one time an archangel and then he kind of blew it? There's, there's talk of that. Um... We know for sure he was an angel, but I don't I don't know if I'd call him an archangel. I don't know. Um, it's kind of hard to hard to tell because it's I mean, scripture doesn't speak a whole lot on that. Well, I thought so. he got so puffed up. That yeah, that's the that's the implication. Um, we we get that sometimes from Isaiah 14. Um, there's some passages in Ezekiel that talk about this as well. But really, when you look at Isaiah 14, it's, it's really talking about a ruler on the earth, not talking about the devil. Um, that's where we get to say Lucifer, by the way. So King James Version uh, saw this Hebrew word, and they're like, ah, let's just say Lucifer. Um, it has to do with lights, which is why matches used to be called Lucifers. Um, <laughs> but um, so the, but the, the key there is, is Jesus himself talks about, I saw him fall from heaven like lightning. So he, he speaks of the falling of the devil being cast down to the earth, um, which would be on what day? Sometime right after the completion of the first week, right? Because he shows up right away in that serpent to tempt Eve and thus Adam. And we have that happen. Okay? Good question. We've got to try to stay with what Scripture says. So we there's a lot of thoughts about the devil, and some of them are good and right, and some of them are just the temptation of people to get into dark things and want to dwell there. Um, uh, it, it never fails. In a confirmation class, you start talking about angels and demons. You know which one the kids are going to ask more questions about. Always the demons. Well, I think the demons are more scary. Yeah, you know, they, some people don't think the devil has power, right? Well, he, he's referred to as Peter as, as walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Okay, uh, Saint Paul talks about him being uh, able to manifest as an angel of light, meaning that he's not always going to be horns and a pitchfork, e easy to point out. Uh, sometimes he'll show up and it'll look like, oh, ah, this is great. Um, the thing I, I try to point people towards is with demons and stuff is is. How does that Lord deal with them? You know, how, how does Jesus, when he encounters somebody who's de demonically possessed, what does he do? He takes them out. Yeah. To almost put it crassly, he tells them, shut up, get out. And what do they do? They get out. They shut up and they get out. Now that, that's the same Jesus who's ascended into heaven, ruling and reigning over all things now. That's the same Jesus who, who promised his protection and everything else for you in baptizing you. And so when you ponder, like, demons and things like that, I mean, okay, yeah, they're out there, but, ha, who's a whole lot stronger? And who do they actually still have to listen to? Does a prayer help keep them away from you? Absolutely. Prayer is, is prayer, prayer does much. Um, recalling God's promises does much. The devil never wants to be confronted by God's promises. He flees from them. Because uh, his business is always he wants to distract you from the promises of God. Uh, whether it's by fear or, or whatever. He wants to get away from, from those things of God. But recalling them then is your perfect weapon against that. Yeah? Well, the demons know that Christ has power over them. Because mm -hmm. when they say he's, they say, put us in the other to the swine and stuff. Yeah. It just, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're terrified of Jesus. A couple times when, when Jesus shows up on the picture, they think it's the, the last day. They don't understand um, all the things of God. 
obviously the demons. Uh, and they think Jesus is there on, and it's the last day and they're going to be destroyed. And they plead for, I guess, mercy to be thrown into a herd of pigs so they can run the pigs off the cliff. Um, which shows their true nature, is that they're, they're selfish and, and yet, you know, they just destroy things. Which is what they do. So, but absolutely, prayer, the word of God, these are, these are our, our mighty weapons against demonic things. Um, absolutely. And because those are, those are things of Jesus. And the things of Jesus, if people, uh, if demons had to respond to, to Jesus on earth when he's there and he's saying, shut up and get out, well, all the more reason now that they'll listen to his word. Um, so, yeah. Good question, though. All right, all right. We'll go through one more. Holy Week's proper proper preface, uh, one of my favorites. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we usually start out with the same thing. Who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross? That where death arose, their life also might rise again. Okay, pointing forward to Easter. And that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there uh, likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Um, that God has this ultimate sense of irony, right? That the devil overcomes Adam and Eve by this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, tempting them to eat of its fruit. But then God does what? Fine, I'm going to use a tree too. I'm going to use a tree to destroy everything you do. Um, and so by the tree of the cross, the devil is overcome. Uh, the symbolism in, in all of these is always pretty stark. Um, so pay attention when you, when you get to that part of the service, because that's not always the same every week. Um, and if you come Monday night, it won't be that one, it'll be one of the other common ones. Um, because the one that's most common is the one that talks about who on this day was raised from the dead, referencing Easter Sunday. Okay. Alright, so next week we're going to get into Sanctus, okay? Holy, 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 which is Isaiah 6, uh, but then we'll also add in some, some Matthew 21, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he, bring back the, I think that's Psalm 118. So, um, we'll put them all together in the Sanctus, the song of God's people, here on earth that heaven has come. And is, is, is here now. And, and so we sing. Because that's what God's people do when, when God shows up and His promises are there and He Himself is there. Um, we sing. Last minute question. Otherwise, I think I hear children starting to shuffle upstairs. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus, and for establishing through his word and promise, the institution of the, the Lord's Supper. We ask that you benefit all of our members who partake of your son's body and blood each time they partake, that their faith would be strengthened and their love would also be strengthened. We ask that you work to, by your spirit to help us to prepare to receive such a gift each week as we are given the opportunity. We ask that we would receive this with thanksgiving. We ask you to be with us this week. Be with all those who govern, be with firefighters who are fighting fires, uh, be with all those whose work is difficult or dangerous. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the Holy Spirit be with you all.